Welcome to this brief critical look at epidemic disease and TCM. Epidemics have existed on our planet since the evolution of mankind and have flared up and disappeared with some consistency. This slide shows some of the major recorded epidemics that have affected humanity. As they affect large groups of people within a short period of time, epidemics have played a key role in the histories of many countries, affecting the fates of dynasties and civilizations. In China, epidemics have been a regular occurrence throughout its history. Famines and battles, accompanied by disease, played an important role in the collapse of the Han, the Tang and the Ming dynasties. The Jian An period, at the end of the Han dynasty, underwent a severe epidemic in 217 CE. This epidemic is believed to have been typhoid fever. This period was famous for a group of intellectuals and poets, called the Seven Masters of Jian An, five of whom fell victim to the epidemic. There is evidence that the diseases running in the armies played a role in the outcomes of the famous battles of Red Cliffs and Leisure Ford. These battles were decisive for the fate of the Han Dynasty. It's also worth mentioning that the preface to the Shanghan Lun, which was possibly written around this time, recounts that the death of many members of Zhang Zhongjing's family were the inspiration for his writing the book. The Tang Dynasty was severely affected by the Anlu Shan Rebellion in 755 CE. The battles in this rebellion resulted in significant population loss, famine and disease. A powerful Buddhist monk named Amogavajra was advisor to the emperor and supposedly employed disease against the rebels. This period marked the beginning of the slow decline of China's culturally richest dynasty. The Great Plague, which contributed to the fall of the Ming dynasty in the 17th century, began in 1633 in Shanxi. It was probably a mixture of bubonic and pneumonic plague. By 1641, it had killed 200,000 people in Beijing, considerably weakening the defending army. In 1644, the city's forces were so weakened that the capital fell to the forces of the rebel Li Zichang. His forces in turn were to fall to the northern Manchu, who began the last major dynasty, the Qing dynasty. The Wenbing school of TCM, which started to arise around this time, was propelled by the prevalence of epidemics and a search for solutions to these diseases. The Wenbing physician Wu Yuke wrote his famous treatise the Treatise of Epidemic Febrile Disease, based on his observations from that time. For preliminary information on Wen Bing, see my video, which I reference in the information section below. Although Wen Bing offered new formulas and explanations concerning the evolution of disease, there was permanent and acrimonious debate with those who continued to espouse the Shanghan Lun approach. Criticism from each side was based on preferred anecdotal evidence. The Wenbing school argued that strong warming herbs of the Shanghan Lun would overwhelm victims of epidemic disease. On the other hand, the Shanghan Lun advocates felt that cooling herbs were more dangerous for patients of epidemic disease and that they exacerbated the natural progression of a disease, most often leading to death. Critics said that Wenbing was very good at predicting the stages of epidemic disease, but did little to avert the inevitable outcome. At different times, the imperial court and local governments recognized the impact of epidemic disease on society. Hospitals were established and patients were treated with herbal medicine. However, the central government usually devolved responsibility to local authorities, instead of establishing nationwide norms. Efforts were limited in their efficiency and often inadequate. From the earliest times, individual treatment by a doctor was a luxury not everyone could afford. Most people would stay at home or try to escape from the epidemic-stricken area. The upper classes had access to personal doctors, but the common people, even up to recent times, would mainly resort to religious solutions. Taoist ceremonies were conducted to pray for blessings, and talismans would be hung to remove bad fortune. As it was postulated that bad air or bad qi was responsible for epidemics, herbs and incense would be burned to dispel the pestilential qi. The herbs most commonly burnt were Zhangzhu and Baizhe. Also, the problem of epidemic disease transmission was compounded by Confucian ethics. Zhu Xi, one of the most important Neo-Confucian scholars of the Southern Song Dynasty, recognized the possibility of infection 
but he believed that it was most immoral and unreasonable to evade the responsibility of caring for the family and relatives for fear of infection. Family ethics plays a very important role in Chinese society to this day. It was mainly with the advent of Western medical methods at the beginning of the 20th century that important progress took place in dealing with epidemics. Dr. Wu Lian De was born in Malaysia and studied Western medicine in Cambridge, England. In 1910, he was sent to investigate a serious epidemic in Manchuria. He conducted a post-mortem and identified the disease as pneumonic plague that was spread by air. He introduced a face mask that included layers of cotton and gauze, with strings that secured it to the head. The mask was cheap and easy to manufacture. Most importantly, he had the authority to introduce a strict quarantine, restricting travel. Police officers were instructed to shoot anyone trying to escape from a plague-stricken area. He arranged for buildings to be disinfected and for corpses to be properly cremated. The spring after the plague was brought under control in China, he hosted the International Plague Conference in Shenyang, attended by many international experts. The TCM response to the current epidemic has gone through a number of stages. For reasons of national pride, there was a lot of pressure to show that traditional Chinese medicine was as capable as conventional Western medicine in dealing with the disease. At the time I'm making this video, the current practical conclusion is best summarized by the WHO document shown on this slide, which states that the Chinese approach to COVID-19 is based on the integration of TCM and conventional medicine. This has been supplemented by a document called the Diagnosis and Treatment Protocol for COVID-19 Patients, a large part of which refers to conventional Western medical analysis and treatment. Treatment by TCM alone has proved problematic, and I will examine some of the issues encountered. According to the notions of Wen Bing, the disease has been diagnosed as a damp toxin epidemic or a cold dampness epidemic. This diagnosis was based on the most common symptoms encountered earlier on in the epidemic, which were breathing difficulties, fever and dry cough. These could eventually degrade into severe respiratory distress, organ failure and potentially death. The diagnosis and protocol document I mentioned earlier expands this to correspond to different stages of the disease, as summarized in this slide. Over the course of the epidemic, various herbal treatments have been proposed. The most commonly used treatments have been Qingfei Pai Du Tang and Lianhua Qingwen Capsule. Both of these are composite formulas. Lianhua Qingwen is a formula offered in capsule form, originally developed to treat SARS. It was widely distributed during the epidemic in Hong Kong and Shanghai. Qingfei Pai Du Tang was one of the first decoctions recommended by the Chinese State Administration of Traditional Chinese Medicine for treating symptoms associated with the epidemic disease. Let's take a look at this formula in more detail. Qing Fei means to clear the lungs, and Pai Du means to remove a poison or toxin. At first glance, this formula seems somewhat overwhelming, as it consists of 21 herbs. Fortunately, we can simplify this, because it's based on four basic formulas, with the addition of some qi tonifying and regulating herbs. The four formulas are Ma Xing Shi Gan Tang, Wu Ling San, Xiao Chai Hu Tang, and Shugan Ma Huang Tang. All four formulas are over 1800 years old and are first found in the two classics written by Zhang Zhongjing, the Shang Han Lun and the Jin Gui Yao Lue. For more information on the Shang Han Lun, check out the links below for my videos. In turn, Lian Hua Qing Wen is based on Ma Xing Shugan Tang and Yin Chao San. Yin Chao San is a Wen Bing formula created by Wu Ju Tong. Ma Xing Shi Gan Tang, or ephedra and apricot seed decoction, appears in the Taiyang section of the Shanghan Nun. Its name comes from the four component herbs in the formula, Ma Huang, Zhe Gan Cao, Xing Ren, and Shi Gao. This formula is used when there is wheezing, coughing, and there is general difficulty in breathing. There will be fever, which can be accompanied by sweating. The pulse will be rapid and slippery. The tongue will have a thin white or yellow coating. 
there is a paper on PubMed which indicates that Ma Xing Shagantang has antiviral properties. Wu Ling San, or the five ingredient powder, also appears in the Taiyang section of the Shanghan Nun. Check the information section below for a link to my video on this formula. It consists of five herbs Guizhe, Zixie, Zhu Ling, Fu Ling, and Bai Zhu. The signs and symptoms associated with this formula are fever with a headache and a feeling of irritability, and the patient is very thirsty, though he may find it difficult to urinate. According to TCM, one explanation for the use of this formula is the notion of Shui Yi Zhang, or water reversal. This explanation states that the body is unable to process water correctly. Fluids accumulate in the body, giving rise to symptoms of internal dampness. Dampness is regarded as one of the main causes leading to the blockage of organ activity. I have covered Xiao Chai Hu Tang in another video. This formula appears in the Shaoyang section of the Shanghan Nun, and it's named after the principal herb used in this formula. It consists of Chai Hu, Huang Qin, ginger prepared Ban Xia, and fresh ginger, plus three other herbs that don't appear in the formula we're considering today. The signs and symptoms that concern us are alternating fever and chills, discomfort in the chest and hypochondriac region, and a bitter taste in the mouth with a dry throat. Shogan Ma Huang Tang has similarities with the famous Xiao Qing Long Tang formula, and it's found in Zhang Zhongjing's book Jing Gui Yao Lue. It consists of Zhou Wan, Dong Hua, Shogan, and Xi Xin, then three herbs already mentioned in previous formulas. Shogan Ma Huang Tang is prescribed for symptoms similar to whooping cough. All the herbs are beneficial for the lungs. There are a number of papers on PubMed citing evidence of antiviral activity in this formula. So how appropriate is Qingfei Pai Du Tang for this epidemic? This slide shows a summary of the signs and symptoms of each of the four formulas separately. We can see that they align with the original main signs and symptoms associated with the epidemic. However, the epidemic evolves, and if we look at one of the latest variants, we can see that there is a much more varied range of signs and symptoms. Most troubling is the fact that between 30 and 40% of the patients are asymptomatic, but are nonetheless able to transmit the disease. Also, it's been noted that no common pattern has been observed for the tongue or the pulse. Three of the formulas that I've referenced are associated with very different pulse patterns. Thus we can ask ourselves if, from the point of view of syndrome differentiation, the four formulas combined are more efficient or appropriate than if they were taken separately according to their classical recommendations. In response, if we consider disease differentiation, we could say that the formula uses 10 herbs that are acrid in taste and are thus associated with the lungs. The formula uses a number of powerful herbs that are known for their action on the most serious signs and symptoms that I've mentioned. I need to note, though, that a number of these herbs have come under criticism in the West as containing potentially toxic compounds, even though they've been used in China for centuries. In summary, the paradigm used by herbal medicine is inappropriate for dealing with epidemic disease. Signs and symptoms alone cannot identify the vectors of a disease, and thus won't necessarily help to reduce its transmission. Epidemics, by their nature, require a large-scale formulaic and organizational approach. The changing range of signs and symptoms would imply using different herbal formulas for different cases. And given the fragility of many patients, relying on a single formula solution without suitable oversight would appear dangerous. This kind of oversight would require disproportionate resources. So given these arguments, it's unusual that UCLA and UCSD are currently doing the clinical trial shown in this slide. I'm not arguing against herbalism in general, but against relying on its associated methodologies for a unique solution to epidemics. In general, testing and vaccination according to modern conventional Western medicine has had more success in controlling this epidemic. As mentioned in the WHO document, TCM and its methodologies can be very appropriate as a means of maintaining a strong immune system and may well be useful for dealing with long COVID problems, for which Western medicine offers few solutions. Given the current state of affairs, 
the joint approach proposed in the WHO document may be appropriate. Thank you for watching this video and I hope you'll join me for future videos in this series. Thank you.